definitely. <laughs> well, welcome and everybody. For the actual uh, PASM debugging, that one actually um, that actually uses the same blob um, because I, I I did that actually. Um, so if that one it actually isn't that bad. Um, I think the um, non-blob version of the debug, the, the software kind of version, still doesn't support all the um, debug functions, does it? No, it doesn't. But the the, the hard part uh, is the windows on the PC side. Um, you know, the scope and uh, graphics windows and things. Yeah, yeah, but. But arguably, the most useful thing is being able to just, to me at least, is being able to just print stuff out from assembly. And well, that that's the thing now. Yes, that's very useful, and, and I'm glad you did that. Um, I don't think I would have been able to do the oh secret project in quotes that is not very secret. No, uh, why am I doing this? <laughs> well, we know at least Ada will be here with us next week. <laughs> so. Hold off, and we can talk more about that at the end of um, this topic, or just hold it for next week. It's good. There's a lot of interest. Um, so today's topic is the P2 documentation update with Jeff. And um, before we get going with Jeff, we'll just do a little bit of um, fun stuff first. Did everybody see my um, funny video? Ha uh ha! -huh, there's a link to it. <laughs> Seems to have been well received. Um, it's uh, just a video about. Um, President Biden talking about the state of semiconductor manufacturing. And uh, he didn't hear our name when I called it out during his presentation, but um, you could watch the video. It's one minute. The link is in the chat. And yeah, we we're talking about the P2, which is very much an American manufactured and designed product and in stock. I also put up the P1, P2, consultant exchange. We have customers, as I mentioned, who want to use the propeller um, to in hardware designs, and they just need some help coding it. So there are several, I guess I'd call them contract type positions with people that uh, I have pre-qualified to some extent who make products, and they need some help. And we've already been able to satisfy one of the needs out there. So, and also if you advertise, if you just want to make yourself known, um, you can go to this place and post a comment that you have certain skills that you can make available. So Are we it's, seeing something about that there somewhere, Ken? Pardon? Should we be seeing something about Oh, where? well, it's under, it's on the Parallax site under news is how you would get there. So okay. I'm, I'm currently logged in. So things look a little bit messy, but it's, um, if you just go on community news and I invite you to read all of the dribble that we put out, but um, somewhere in here, it's right here, Propeller 1 and 2 Consultant Exchange. So actually, I'll just grab a, a link for that while I'm there for you. So yeah, if you offer some particular propeller skills and you'd like others to be aware of them, put your comment in there. And also, we posted two new quick bites um, in the last week. So I'll, I'll drop in some links for them. Um, this was a nice little project uh, for me just to get to use some of the floating points. I made a few examples and I learned some things on the way, like how to display numbers differently with PST, thanks to um, Johnny Mac. And also I noticed that some debug worked inside of Eric's tool, which was really cool and didn't expect that. And there's also this quick bite. Um, Last week, Michael spoke of the motor controller add-on, and he showed his Wi-Fi controlled Arlo, which had been modified. And he had an entire scheme of communication protocol to talk to it over the keyboard. So here's a link to that. And um, check it out. And there's a super video at the beginning of this, too. I should say 15 minutes that just really shows it, even if you're not going to do anything like this. It's good to see how it all works. And um, I mentioned previously, I'll just say it again, if you need P2 edges, we're out of the current P2 edge, I think. And the RAM version, we only have 18 left as of this morning, and we're dealing with component shortages like everywhere. Um, and these parts are usually on allocation or back ordered, but we have our fair share coming. I expect at least a month before we have more of these, unfortunately. So 
Sorry about that. And last week we spoke of this hardware and we saw Chip's demo um, with the low level driver. So we're, we're letting Chip work on that a few more days until, until Friday. I'm just gonna go ahead and do a few muting. Nobody take offense to that. You can unmute yourself whenever you want to. There, I found them, okay. So uh, this is available. We have a whole bunch of them in stock and um, they're shipping now. Here, here's another neat, P1 project, which I posted, you may have come across it. I'll just put a link up here. Last week, Nicholas was here online with us and he was talking a little bit in the chat about his project. So I followed up and harvested the full story from him. And it's a CNC, six axis CNC controller with um, protected IOs for you know spindle coolant or whatever you wanna do with the machine. So super job, Nicholas, and he talks about supply issues and he said that we, we are the least of his worries, thankfully. And then um, coming up soon, there's a really nice quietly brewing, not so secret project out there um, that makes use of the Raspberry Pi for internet connectivity for the P2 that Steven's working on. And we're gonna show this at the upcoming P2 Live Forum. I've just pasted in the chat a link to all of his documentation, which is very, very complete. And by tomorrow, I'll be running this myself as a uh, test pilot or guinea pig or whatever. So more of the P2 motor driver add-ons. I should say about this too, that um, we are lighting chip off the hook after he finishes his low level code and then passing it to one of our beloved P2 Live Forum members here for some further completion. So we expect to turn that into a high level driver where you could have brushless motor control, speed direction, and some kind of distance control over those hoverboard motors that we offer now. And Eric is here. Next week, he's gonna talk about FlexProp very cool. And coming up, I don't know if we're going to hold this one or not. Um, Chip and Jeff talking about uh, single step debugging. And as far as I know, I don't think we're actually going to be ready for this, but we'll worry about that later today. And this is going to be re renamed Raspberry Pi and P2 Internet Connectivity with Stephen and Ken. I think that date will be just fine. So just the topic will change, not the date. And then coming in March, um, I am asking Michael to show us his best practices for integrating the P2 Edge into a PCB design and to make sure all of our files are properly shared. So if anybody's doing a product design that they've got everything they need um, in dip trace at least and whatever other formats we can export to to do their own design. And we'll also have a little project board come out of this where you can um, buy a bag of parts and solder them together yourself to connect to P2 Edge. And Gavin returns. We saw him a year ago. He's been very busy because school restarted and um, his presentation is end of March again. So he will have a year, half of a year with the P2 now. I think actually, no, a whole year. Yeah, a year and a half by that point about. Ah, so. you're here, good to see ya. Yeah, it's Thursday, so I can be here. On Wednesdays, I've got to teach a class, unfortunately, during these, so I won't be able to be here very often. But I will play hooky on that day and give you all a presentation on where we are. And do I have this. the time right? Did we agree at 1 p.m.? Yep, that's 4 okay. p.m. my time, no problem. Cool, that'll be really great. Thanks, Kevin. And today, uh, Jeff, if you don't know Jeff, Jeff's been with Parallax for 26 years and has um, been on the receiving end of everything Chip creates software-wise. Good job, Whoa. Jeff. <laughs> Yeah, he's done most of our software tools, actually, like the Chrome interfaces for the basic stamp, the original basic stamp Windows editor, the propeller tool, all the font creation with that. Um, he's written a number of our user guides too, like the famous basic stamp user manual and the spin user manual for propeller one. And um, so Jeff is just about the nicest person you'll meet, um, but you can still make big requests of him while he talks about what he's doing because he could handle us just fine. So Jeff, are you with us? 
Yeah, I was on mute. I didn't realize it. I was going to say almost 26 years. March 25th will be 26 <laughs> years. But uh, technically, I've been with Parallax, or at least with Parallax products, uh, since, uh, well, like a year, year or so before that, because right out of college, uh, I started experimenting with the basic stamp one and learning all about it. Uh, and then, and can you share the funny story of how you became employed? <laughs> yes, I was almost laid off and employed uh, in the same week. Um, I had just bought a house. I was out of college, bought a house, been working for a company writing software for about six months, and they were having financial trouble. <clears throat> I was uh, staring at the ceiling in my new house, laying on my bed and wondering, oh, they, they were, you know, <clears throat> threatening layoffs. And I thought, what am I going to do? And then uh, one of the co-owners of Parallax called me just randomly and said, hey, would you like a job? Uh, <laughs> I said, what, what are you talking about? Uh, yeah, I'd come in for an interview. And uh, uh, it was the longest interview I've ever had and also the most fun interview I've ever had uh, and never looked back. Uh, so it was fantastic. It, Parallax saved me. Yeah, you, you just traded one roller coaster for another. <laughs> That's very true also, yes. <laughs> Anything but boring. Yeah, definitely. So what do you have today? Enjoy it. There are all these enthusiastic people here. Okay, well, I uh, will show you. Um, let me uh, switch to share screen here. Okay, so... Uh, so what I wanted to do is uh, begin by talking about what documentation we have and where to find it uh, and what types of documentation uh, is available. Uh, so to start with here, I'll post a, a link that I'll demonstrate on the screen. That wasn't supposed to happen. Um, so what I wanted to, well, I'm getting ahead of myself here. What I wanted to say is that if there's nothing else you remember from this presentation, uh, just remember this one thing that to, to find our propeller documentation, go to our main website, find propeller, propeller two and documentation right here. Uh, on this page, all of our existing published documents um, plus all the live uh, documentation, the active documentation or actively developed documentation lives on this page uh, uh, somewhere in this top uh, half of the page. Uh, so it's important to remember that and go there, you know, often to see what the newest thing is. Uh, and as we continue on, the most, uh, the, the latest and most important documents um, will kind of float up to the top of this list here. Right now, they're a little bit intermixed, partly because we haven't completely absorbed all of CHIP's uh, wonderful documentation into the stuff that we're going to make the official Propeller 2 documentation for, for time going forward. Uh, so what I wanted to show is right up at the top, there's a, there's a couple of PDFs for the, the spec sheet, which is just a single page document to give you a, a quick overview of the of features of the Propeller 2, uh, and the data sheet, which is a much more in-depth uh, view that talks about, uh, well, introduces features of the hardware. Uh, and, and then down a little bit lower here, oh, I should mention this P2 Quick Bytes too. In fact, I'll open that up. Um, this is an important place to go, especially if you're a beginner, uh, to check out uh, various little concise projects, real world examples of doing things. There's a lot of fun stuff here. I haven't even uh, had a chance to, to look at all of them, but uh, we continue to add to this, um, you know, whenever we have a chance. Um, Ken, do we have uh, outside contributors to those as well? I, actually, every single thing there was developed by somebody else. Yeah. Ah, okay. Ken's usually the one that actually puts it there, as far as I know. I just put uh, my so. name on the top because I post it, but I didn't actually contribute any intellect to anything there. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, and then down here is what I really wanted to focus on, uh, the hardware and language documentation, or rather the web documentation section. So uh, this item right here is the data sheet. It's an online comment, commentable um, doc. It's the 
Google Doc version of the PDF that, that you saw at the top there uh, of the data sheet uh, looks like this. Uh, I don't know if there's any comments in it at the moment, but um, you can go in there, uh, highlight things, comment on them, and we will answer right there and address the issue if you found something that's missing or something that's not clear enough. Uh, okay, and then moving on, this is uh, the silicon documentation, which many of you have already uh, been quite familiar with. Uh, it's the original design material that Chip wrote towards the end of developing the P2 hardware and certainly has been updating it uh, right after the release of the P2 Silicon 2, everybody. Um, and right below that is the first document that I contributed to. Uh, well, no, I actually worked on this data sheet too, but this hardware manual is essentially, it pulls material from the Silicon dock and also adds some more uh, on top of it, eventually it will supplement the silicon doc. Uh, and other information that's in the silicon doc will be contained in some other dedicated uh, documentations. One of them uh, that I will talk about today, which is this PASM2 manual. Um, below that is the PASM2 instructions spreadsheet, which is not that. Sorry, the little the little sharing thing is in my way. Can't quite click on what I want to click on. There we go. Um, so this is, uh, many of you have probably seen this. This is the list of, it's actually a design doc that Chip used uh, himself that lists all of the different instructions, uh, or the PASM instructions, the propeller tube assembly instructions uh, in the propeller chip and categorizes them and shows some other details uh, that are important to assembly programmers. It's actually quite large, as you can see, scrolls onto the right. There's lots of uh, critical information in here, but it's a little bit hard to find sometimes and sometimes also hard to figure out what, what's really important to you, which is the job that I'm trying to solve uh, with this next document, which is the PASM2 manual. Uh, so this is a, currently it's, it's, it's oh, let me say one more thing before I go on to this. Uh, there's the spin to language documentation down here as well. That is also Chip's original document. Uh, it's the only document that we have that talks about the spin to language uh, currently. Uh, so over the past few months, I've been, uh, amongst other things, trying to document all of these instructions in detail uh, into a manual that uh, is, you know, closer to what we have. Uh, in our previous documentation for the Propeller One. Uh, and current, that link takes you right to this page, uh, which is the, the, the working, the live draft of it. Uh, so there's some information at the top here that describes you know, what this is about. Um, I just added this today. So we're, I have, there's about 489 rows of that um, PASM2 instructions list. They're not all instructions. Um, and some of them look duplicated because there's actually unique opcodes. There are some instructions have multiple syntax um, possibilities that emit uh, unique opcodes. Uh, so thus they take up two or three or four rows uh, in that uh, list. Uh, so of those 489 you know, items that are listed there, I've got about 75% of them documented now uh, in this manual, which was a lot more difficult than I anticipated uh, at first. Um, and then there are also about 740 uh, unique symbols that the compiler understands that belong to the spin two language. Um, kind of looks like this. Um, so this was something that I pulled right out of the compiler, sorted these so that I could make sure that I've documented everything. The little green indicators in front of these items indicate that I've documented that uh, in, the, uh, in the document I'm about to show you. Um, so uh, to begin with, this, this manual is intended to be a reference for each and every PASM instruction. 
Um, you know, each one is unique, has various capabilities, uh, and uh, sometimes you'll need to like dive right in. You know exactly what you're looking for. You can dive right into that instruction and, and hopefully get all the detail you need out of that. Uh, it will also cover things like the language structure uh, uh, and various uh, tips and, and include some examples um, to, for people to kind of get started programming in assembly on the propeller too. Um, that material is what I'm going to be working on uh, fairly soon. But for right now, it's just reference for these instructions. So I wanted to show you how to find information here. Um, one of the most important things is this outline on the left side. Uh, it, uh, it, you know, it basically points to all the different headings in the document, but in particular, go to this categorical listing. This is where I've taken all of the instructions and organized them by the category that they belong in. Um, so there's conditions, effects, flag modification. And then down further, we start getting into actual instructions for cog control, process control, flow control, math, timing, event handling, uh, and whatnot. Um, so this document's gonna be, there'll be lots of cross references here to hopefully guide people along their way of just kind of diving in, finding something of interest and potentially learning about something related. Uh, so I'll just show you uh, an example here. So I'll go to the math section and you just click this link for absolute and it takes you to the description of the absolute instruction. Uh, and the way this is organized, each one follows roughly the same format um, where at the top, it starts out very simple, giving you just little bits of information like this is actually kind of a pronunciation of that instruction. It's what I say in my head when I see the absolute instruction uh, as I'm reading through code. Uh, the next is lists the category that it belongs in, uh, followed by a very short one-liner uh, for what that instruction does. And by the way, these are linked back, so I can click back here and get right back to the math section where that is where I came from, possibly to get to that instruction. Uh, so I intend to, for everything to be linked this way. Uh, below that is the uh, various syntaxes. This one has two different syntax options, as you can see here, uh, with and without a source operand. Uh, and then we get into the result of executing this instruction, uh, followed by details of what you provided as input and what their intent is, and the actual encoding of the instruction uh, for those that need to look at um, you know, potentially the actual image, um, the, the RAM view in uh, the propeller tool, or uh, you know, maybe an actual binary file generated, um, and also what it's going to write to, if anything. In this case, it's gonna to write to the D register, which is short for the DEST register. And if the C and Z flags are going to affect anything, what are they going to represent? Uh, so in this case, at the end of this execution, the C flag is going to um, be the same state as the sources bit 31. Uh, the Z flag will indicate whether the final result of the execution of this instruction is zero or not. And then the number of clocks that are required for that particular instruction. Most instructions take two instruction or two clock cycles, uh, but there are a few that take more. Uh, some are variable depending on the situation. Uh, and uh, that information will be uh, displayed in there uh, uh, for, for those particular instructions. Below that is if there's anything, any instructions that are related, conceptually related uh, perhaps to this instruction like the negate instruction. Uh, so I could bounce over there and read about that. Um, go back here. And, and then below that is a deeper explanation of what the instruction does, what the flags mean, and any special notes about it. This is a pretty simple example. Some of them get uh, pretty elaborate, uh, like, let's see, like this cog init uh, instruction. There's a lot of possibilities with this, so thus there's a lot, of, a lot to explain uh, here, and then some different examples of use. Uh, oh, and one other thing I wanted to point out is, I'm not sure if this is a really good example of that, but as you read through this, 
uh, you might find that some of the information seems to be repeated uh, because we we start with from very simple, a little bit more, a little bit more detail, and then a lot of detail at the end. Uh, so I, I did that so that um, as you're learning PASM and you're going through the manual uh, and uh, uh, you know uh, going through various learning exercises, you might find that oh, I just I really need just this. After a while, you'll understand exactly what this means and you won't need any more detail. But before that, you might need to you know, peruse what the result does, what each of these parameters do. Um, and what I tried to do in those areas that seem kind of repetitive is talk about the same thing in a slightly different way, which hopefully um, improves your memory uh, of, of exactly what it does and hopefully gets rid of any ambiguity uh, that may exist from, you know, previous simpler statements. Um, also, I wanted to show you here, I showed you the categorical listings, which I highly recommend people start there looking through and it gives you a good idea of um, like the 50,000 foot view of the language. What is it capable of? What, what handful of instructions are for which purpose? Um, below that, is a listing of all the instructions in alphabetical order. So if you know the exact instruction, you can just dive right into that spot. But uh, I tend to go to the category a lot uh, and, and find what I'm looking for there. Uh, I want to point out that some instructions are kind of paired with others, like and 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 not are very similar to each other. Uh, so instead of taking up more space, we just combine them into the same simple explanation. Uh, and something I forgot to note here is that when there's one or more, when there's more than one syntax item listed here, the encoding table follows the same order. So this is the encoding for this top syntax. This is the encoding for the bottom syntax. Um, and it's, uh, it's kind of handy to look through that uh, to determine why or how, how they are different, how the compiler or how the propeller knows that they are actually uh, encoded or, you know, you provide a different operands uh, or that uh, it's doing, performing a different function. Like in this case, it's an and or an and not, uh, depending on really just this, this one bit in this instruction encoding right here. Uh, let's see, and... Let's take a look here. So the right column uh, indicates what will be written to at the end of the instruction or as part of the instruction execution. Most of the time, this is the destination register. Uh, some of them don't write to anything like that. Uh, maybe just affect flags. Uh, some of them affect multiple areas. So in this case, it's we're, we're storing something on the stack, which is represented by K. Uh, and also the program counter is updated. Uh, through the execution of this. So I tried to provide all of those nitty gritty details where I can. Um, and uh, this is a good segue for something I was uh, wanting to talk about, uh, feedback. I would love to have feedback constantly. Whenever you see something or question something, want to know more about something and you can't find it, um, please come in here and, um, and tell me about it. So. Here's an example of how you could do that. Um, uh, here, a gentleman, uh, you know, highlighted this item and then clicked the little comment button up here and wrote this comment. Why would this rely on the state of Z? And then he goes and explains why he doesn't understand that. Um, and I've come in here and, and answered this. And actually, the answer was sort of in here already. Um, uh, but it was kind of buried down in this. So I was pointing that out, uh, that uh, there's more information to be had uh, in this section that, you know, okay. details uh, what, how that actually works and how that, that instruction relates to some others uh, for this multi-long, this extended math operation. Uh, but feel free to comment, uh, make suggestions uh, for, for anything, because I don't always know what, uh, what you guys are looking for. Sometimes I'll know exactly that 
you know, a piece of information is missing and I'll just, you know, note that, yes, I'm, I'm on it. I've got it noted. Uh, and uh, let's see, I wanted to show you also, here's a, like a, a little bit more of a visual of what's in here. So you've seen the, let me back up here. You've seen the spreadsheet uh, from Chip that shows every opcode uh, in the propeller too. Um, for my own use, uh, while documenting this, I've been just, I have a copy of that uh, and I've been highlighting every row in green to indicate what I've documented. So, so here's a little visual of everything that's already documented in that uh, thing, in that manual. Um, it's quite a lot, it's taken uh, quite a bit of time and I've uh, learned a number of things too, stuff that, um, you know, Chip knows off the top of his head, but I didn't know and it wasn't clear to me through any other documentation. So when I've come across that in conversation with him, when I'm, you know, poking his brain for some little detail about something he wrote here, I take that information that he has, make some notes, put it in the document uh, as soon as I can. Okay. And Let's see, so what is coming uh, in this document? Uh, what's missing is uh, some of the leading stuff. This leading sections up here at the start are, uh, they might be empty or very sparse. Uh, like here's a good example. Um, by the way, the I don't know if you knew from what I showed at the start, but these little yellow indicators, just ignore those. Um, they're usually notes to myself. This one means to be written, of course. Um, draft means uh, I'm pretty happy with this. I'm just waiting for somebody else to review it. Um, we'll have somebody inside that reviews it or if a customer wants to review it and say, hey, this looks good or I'd appreciate if you add this or I don't understand the point here, uh, have at it, comment away. Uh, and there's also some uh, little uh, sprinkled yellow highlights in various areas that are just notes to myself. Let's see if I can find one here. Um, of course, I can't find one live. Uh, just little notes to myself to link something. Maybe maybe I don't have Alt, or excuse me, like uh, Alt X. That's not even an instruction. Maybe this one is not documented. Uh, in fact, I think that one isn't, and I forgot to highlight it. It's supposed to be highlighted yellow. Uh, just so that I know to come back through. And when that section has been written, um, I touch that up so that we've got some good cross references there. Uh, so after getting through all the instructions, my intention is to uh, go back through and describe the structure of the language, uh, it, it, you know, showing examples of how do you, what's the, what's the minimum you need for an assembly program? <clears throat> How does it fit together with other things? Uh, start showing some some tips uh, and examples of uh, you know various uses of things, uh, and then sprinkle some more examples through the actual instruction details uh, where needed. Some of them uh, really need some little visuals or an actual example of code uh, to better realize uh, how it operates. Um, after that, uh, and maybe sort of at the same time, uh, somewhat, I'll be switching over pretty heavily to the SPIN2 documentation, which right now is just a skeleton. Essentially, it's the category, categorized list. Um, and so I don't have anything to show you on that. But uh, my intention is to, I, I think I forgot to say that this document here has been live for a couple of months. I think. Um, so people from that documentation page right here on the Parallax site, people could go in there and, you know, see the latest stuff, watch me edit things if they want, uh, and uh, make comments. Uh, and I've been addressing those as I've, I've gone on. Uh, for the SPIN document, uh, I intend to have a version of that live uh, probably in about a month from now. Um, and then I'll just continue uh, adding to it as fast as I can uh, with the intent to wrap all of this up 
by summertime, uh, so like by July. Uh, so right now this document um, that I've been discussing is about, uh, well, it's got about 75% of the instructions documented. I'd say it's probably about 65% complete. The data sheet is about 90% complete and the hardware manual as it stands is about 75%. Um, one of the main things that needs to be added here is uh, some more information about uh, smart pins and uh, some of that information will actually be in the, um, uh, the, the spin, will kind of mix between the spin and the um, PASM2 manual as well. But a majority of the uh, hardware specific things will be in this particular manual. Uh, so I think that's, that's everything that I wanted to describe. Uh, so I'll take some questions. Uh, right now, if anybody has them. Jeff, maybe looping back to the SPIN2 manual, there is a document there. Yes, that and document is, do I have this open? Yeah, so this is um, the core document that Chip wrote uh, while developing the SPIN language uh, and then afterwards as he's adjusted it. Uh, so you can get a lot of what you need uh, just by perusing this. Um, I know it's not in the format that, that some of you might be used to from our previous documentation, and that's the part that I will be working on next, is grabbing that information, kind of massaging it, organizing things, and, and sort of uh, teaching it in more of a um, you know, tutorial, step one, step two uh, fashion. Sorry, I jumped in there, Ken. Is that what yeah, you were? Yeah, that's kind of. Yeah, I just wanted you to show it and explain really what it is and isn't. So, like Chip's view is, yeah, it's sure it's all here, but we need to make it useful for people to to read and learn from. Yeah, and I'd say that um, in most cases, every, every little detail is in here somewhere, um, and my job is to uh, you know take that and try to find stuff that is you know, maybe some of the rare questions uh, also even, um, and make sure that there's a little tidbit about that little factoid everywhere where it belongs. Um, uh, you know, for example, where does the, where does the variable end up at uh, after a, a, a for loop, I mean, a, a repeat loop? Um, that was, that's been a topic on the forum and, uh, and Chip made a, a change to it. Uh, I believe uh, related to something uh, somebody said in, the, in one of the other um, P2 Live forums. Uh, so all those little details will be documented in that section and you could probably find them here, but uh, sometimes it might be hard. Um, and there's certainly, there's so much about the, this chip is such a big world um, that, uh, you know, even we forget to mention certain things, uh, uh, as I've found while documenting PASM2, that uh, certain things I've learned from Chip, uh, he didn't, uh, he, he didn't either didn't have it documented or he's forgotten exactly where it is. Um, and, uh, and so I'm trying to make that bring that stuff to the surface. So let's get some questions, requests for you. Everybody wants, of course, aside from having this done, that's what they really want. It's what we all want. But um, me too. Maybe, <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> it should be noted too that you work mostly alone with Stephanie's help and Michael and a Chip as you need them, right? Yes. Yes. Most of the time, um, I am just plugging away at the latest thing. And whenever I have a, a, something I can't answer, I contact Chip. Um, maybe a, a little style suggestion I get from Stephanie. Um, for the most part, I'm just working on it in silence <laughs> uh, until I you know, get it done. Uh, so I'm not always uh, able to bend Chip's ear uh, too. You know, he's sometimes working on various little things, um, occasionally stuff that has been brought up in, in one of these live forums. Uh, that he's working on. And so as soon as he can, he gets back to me. 
um, and uh, and then I move forward with it. So I don't let that stuff slow me down. Um, I usually can kind of tuck it away and move on to something else with some notes to, to take me back there in case he doesn't get back to me. Um, so I try to address all those things. And uh, there's not always a time where Chip is looking at the documentation I'm generating unless I'm specifically pointing something out. Uh, so uh, if, if you guys question something that's written, uh, I'm one of the first people to wonder if it's actually correct. You know, if, if you guys are questioning it, I'm questioning it. I, I have verified a lot of stuff, but certainly there's going to be something that, that I've missed. I'm hoping uh, one of you or Chip will find those little details and we can address it right away. Jeff, do we have any documentation, internal documentation that we have not released to the public yet? Not usually. Uh, most of the time, uh, like probably the best examples of something like that is if I'm working on a diagram um, that hasn't been published yet, uh, I'll certainly, you know, try to true it up, make it what I think it should be, and then paste it into the document. Um, and then after that, uh, you, when I make those edits or more edits to that diagram, it, it goes into the document immediately um, live. Uh, so we have had um, in the past, we've taken and taken little, um, like we'll make a PDF of something. There were two examples uh, at the start of this presentation. Those are static until we go and, and update those. That web documentation section is um, intended to supplement that stuff so that you can see, you can get the very latest. Uh, and uh, I think going forward, I want to make the spin document live, a live workspace, um, uh, just like I did for the PASM2 document. Uh, and probably also the other two that I've worked on, the data sheet and uh, the hardware manual, uh, so that we will have a, a PDF version that will you know, kind of peel off, make a copy, truth and true some things up like uh, pagination to make it look prettier so that people can download that and just, you know, keep it in their pocket or whatnot. Um, but the live version will always be there. So we don't really have, if there's documentation you're not seeing, chances are it's because we just haven't gotten to that yet. As a um, follow-on, um, go ahead, Ada. Um, I've seen you don't have the bit permutation instructions in the PASM document yet. Um, are you aware of Chip's uh, nice high quality graphics uh, he made to explain these? Because these just hurt your head, you know, the merge W, um, split W, uh, merge B, split B, that, those. No, in oh. fact, I might not be aware of that. Uh, I don't recall seeing something. So you're talking about, um, let's see, these are, are you talking about these instructions here? Yes, these, uh, they, they all make your head hurt. And um, without these graphics, you don't understand them. Yeah, yeah. In fact, um, a lot of what I've done here is uh, documented things that I could hit fast um, or something that was just of particular interest to me. I would hit those first. The things that I knew, oh, this is going to take uh, an extra amount of time to learn just to document this one thing. I've tried to kind of table that for now so that I could get more information in here that hopefully is 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 worth it um, to you know the general public that's using the, the P2. But I'm running out of those things now. Um, so I put the, the uh, graphics into into the chat uh, if you look at those, oh thank uh, you. Chip made some some nice PNGs you could just drop them in there. Yeah, yeah so that'd be great. Uh, here's I bring really it up on screen right now. Thank you for that link. Ah oh, fantastic. Yes, I haven't seen this. Was this? Oh, yeah, it was posted in the forum. Wow, years ago, too. Yeah, see, I don't always know what is available. Um, These and not because they look like a laser show. They do. It's kind it of fun. Wonderful. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, was, uh, I wasn't aware of these. I, I intended to make something uh, to demonstrate this, but it wasn't going to you know, have all these little lines. So uh, I'll probably just drop these in there. That sounds um, good. Yeah. Yeah. Don't redraw them. Yeah. I don't want to, don't want to reinvent the wheel. Um, 
So that's great. Thank you for telling me that. If you have any other little tidbits like that, um, drop a link into the document, make a little comment in the right area and just say, hey, Jeff, did you know about this? Um, yeah, there's this a bunch of little tricks. I can't remember them all at once, but uh, like, and do you have the fact that you can use the alt s and alt d when the um, next instruction has an immediate, because that's really useful. But it's not kind of obvious because you think alt s is designed for memory indexing, but it can also do a, an addition and then put that into the immediate field. Yes, and some of those things that you're pointing out, uh, or like that one, uh, is something that I, I had no idea was possible um, until Chip just offhand happened to mention it to me when we were talking about something else. Um, and so I'm trying to, you know, get these little details down uh, as soon as I find out about them, um, because I'm sure like if I, have, I didn't know about it. Really weird trick that I, that I just don't remember right now. But I know that there's that there's a bunch of them. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. Same thing, same thing here. Um, when I go back through my notes, I often find things and think, wow, I, I've forgotten about that again. Um, luckily, I noted it so I could document it. Yeah, and I would love to get that kind of stuff, uh, you know, in the in the right spot in the document so that hopefully we can all find it uh, at the right time in our development experience. Uh, to to actually make use of it. I have a general have a question. question. Yeah, um, I have a question. Oh, go ahead. We have lots of them now. Yeah, um, I'm mostly concerned about. Well, most I'm somewhat concerned about synchronizing what you've done with uh, what Eric has been doing. Um, and I, I know that this is this is probably more of a an issue for Ken uh, from a management standpoint. But I mean, Eric has this really nice uh, multi-platform, multi-language compiler, but it doesn't implement quite the same thing that that Chip has done and is being documented. And I think it will be important later going forward to, uh, to at least point out, to somehow coordinate with Eric, um, you know, like flagging certain examples with an asterisk or something and a general footnote that, uh, you know, uh, FlexProp does things uh, a little bit differently, refer to this manual here uh for for the differences and the explanations and then and then the issue of encouraging eric to to uh, uh bring things in line uh sooner rather than later well as, as time permits i will try to synchronize with certainly having having better documentation will help in, in that regard um, mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Michael. I, I've been aware of, of some of those uh, things also. In fact, it's one of the reasons that I chose to uh, split the documentation in sections. Part of it was because, well, for the Propeller One, our uh, manual, the printed manual is almost 400 pages. Um, and this was going to be so much more. There's so much more uh, assembly instructions uh, by themselves. And there's a lot more hardware capabilities. So obviously, it was going to be a huge document if it was all, all one thing. Um, but also, in particular, because we have uh, uh, customer tools like Eric's that we really want to em embrace and encourage people to use, um, I decided let's make the, the data sheet and the hardware manual um, try to not um, focus very much on the actual language uh, so that it leaves flexibility for customer tools that may do it um, you know, a little differently. Uh, and hopefully that documentation can be used by uh, those tools and you know, distributed or linked to from those tools um, if it's you know, perfectly viable uh, for uh, like for Eric's, Eric's uh, software. In particular. 
particular, um, or if, as an example, I mean, um, the, I think you were suggesting that I make notes uh, where it applies in the PASA manual and, and probably the SPIN manual also for how Eric's does it uh, differently. Not, um, not so much. I, I think just a, 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 little, a little warning. Uh, I mean, I use Eric's um, system almost exclusively because I've got a, a Mac and I mean, I can run Windows software on the Mac, but it's awkward. Right. And so if I have to, I can I could run chips, uh, peanut, or or the prop tool, but it it's inconvenient for me, and I'm I'm sure I'm not alone. And as time goes on, that will uh, occur more often. And so I think it, trying to address it somehow early. Uh, in some fashion is, 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 is well, one thing we idea. can do, Mike, is for every example we publish, and I've been doing this with quick bytes, we will run them on FlexProp and on Propeller Tool to see that the results are the same, unless it's something where Chip is designing some specific functionality into Peanut or Prop Tool, like the graphical debug, and we just know it's not going to work. Um, but everything else I, I'm running in both places to see I get the same results. And that's the only way I, I would know as an amateur of finding these differences and trying to make sure that tool is supported on equal par because I, I totally agree with you. If we're not for Eric, we'd have nothing in the Mac world and Linux world. So it's very important what he's doing. And Stephen is also making a lot of effort to see that there's compatibility. So I think there are a few notable people out there that are you being one of them that are doing our best here. Yeah, and I think uh, for me, unless I, unless Eric has a document that really describes uh, these differences, um, it would just take me kind of like going through that experience too, just like like Ken did, uh, running examples in, in different in the different tools to figure out where it's different, um, and uh, we haven't really or like Eric and I haven't really discussed that openly. I had some ideas early on about something we could do to, to kind of help out with this without impeding either side. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, certainly some kind of warning uh, would really help people if they're gonna, you know, end up falling into that, to that, uh, that little trap. And maybe we can make things closer. Uh, it sounds like Eric was kind of implying that um, as time goes on. Yeah, ho hopefully we can converge. There'll probably always be some differences. Um, and I I try to document the differences, mostly for, for spin two and for spin, I've, I've tried to just refer to the original parallax documentation and say, okay, here are the differences. Uh, I'm sure I haven't caught them all. <laughs> there's, there's plenty of work there, and I'm always happy to get contributions from the community. Um, you know, if, if you see something in the documentation, please uh, send me a note about it. Hey, can I ask Eric something, and maybe all you guys? Do you hear me? Yes. Okay, sorry. So. Eric, last, yesterday I was working with Stephen Morocco and we're, he was building a table that had pointers to string elements, right? Which were variable sized. And he was using the at at operator to uh, you know, add the object base address to whatever that offset was that was stored in the table. And uh, you know, we could use, depending on what the requirement is, we could use bytes, words, or longs. Longs will always work. Words will work for, for, I'm talking about for the pointer, for the offset values. Longs will always work. Words will work if your object is less than 64K and bytes would work for like very, very small cases of objects. In fact, what he had actually would still fit in a byte, but it was dangerous to use. So I realized what we need to do if we're, is possibly, and I added it to my assembler, but it's, I don't know what to make of it. 
I put in a size check so that when we do, like when we emit a byte, I make sure it's either, you know, uh, equal to or above minus 128 to accommodate signed byte values. And it can be positive up to FF. So um, minus half range to full range. And we do that for words also, no need to check for long. So I immediately, like when I compiled my uh, interpreter, you know, I had a few things that I was just letting the uh, assembler rip off the upper bits and just keep the low byte. So it would cause some incompatibility with existing source code. Someone would have to go through and put like an and FF, you know, if they're, if they're using, if they're defining, if they're saying byte and they're putting in a value that's bigger than eight bits, uh, they'd have to like and it with FF to make it fit. Kind of like how we qualify uh, operands in PASM. So I kind of think it's safe to do because what it would allow people to do is like, you know, use less than longs safely and assuredly for things like uh, pointer tables for DAT structures. But what do you think about that? It wasn't a thing already. What? I thought that was a thing already. No, well, but maybe I it, just it is for remembered. operands, but not for byte, word, and long data. Well, I should say for byte and word data. Long doesn't care. I think I may maybe slide. Not does Flexpin do it? I think no, my own do weird custom assembler does it. Yeah, that's a good question. I can't remember. Uh, <laughs> let me just try. <laughs> um, traditionally, am, am I? While you're thinking about that, traditionally this would be a warning if there's a possibility of data loss. Am I correct? Right. It would it would warn you if you were doing something where it was stripping off upper bits, except in the case of negative numbers where you have you know, room for the sign bit. Yeah, it, it, I think making it a warning would be prudent because, rather than an error, uh, then existing uh, code would still work. Yeah, okay. So I'll have to, uh, yeah, maybe I need to start making like a warning buffer where I can stream the warning messages into. Ah. Yeah, chips compiler doesn't actually have warnings. It just, it only, it only knows error and it knows pass. Yeah, yeah we're on, we're on. I'll need to do though is uh, I have to like make a status thing where I, I have the file name, the line number and, and the warning. Because see right now I, I get to not do any of that because as soon as I see an error, I just stop everything and then drop the cursor right where the error is. Yeah. That's sometimes annoying because it doesn't, re um, when there's an error that's like, like the 10 megahertz debug error, like when it, when it says you need 10 megahertz clock. It will jump your cursor right at the top, right to the top. Oh, that's, I don't even know where it is. Extremely obnoxious. Yeah. I see, because it is it, it, yeah, maybe it shouldn't in that case move the cursor. I think there's a bunch of other, other errors that don't actually move the cursor anywhere sensible. Um, okay. I'll look into I feel that. Like those should, probably shouldn't jump um, all the way to the top. Okay. Just looping back to Jeff's topic for a moment. Um, the question that comes up a lot of times from the community is about printed manuals and it always generates a lot of discussion inside the office. So when this documentation is mature, if you are somebody who would like to have a spiral bound printed manual, could you reach down to the zoom control bar on the bottom where it says reactions and then uh, put a thumbs up so, so we know really, we never really know how important this is, but is, is this important to you? Tell us. And I jumped the gun and already have gotten printed out at FedEx and it's power bound, even though it was two weeks old as of right now. But, so I've so got a draft. Okay, that's power working bound. then. You're just printing plus, the PDF. Plus from 15 years ago. Thanks for this, Jeff and Chip. This is the original propeller. Yeah, one. look at that. Very well worn. So. <laughs> yeah, Jeff did all that had nothing to do with that. Yeah. Well, I think uh, he had something to do with the P1. Yeah, so. he, he oh. did a little bit. <laughs> well, yeah, you know, it is nice to have paper manual sometimes, but it is nice to just be able to search for what you think you you need to find. So um, one thing I'd like to point out, um, if this wasn't clear uh, from the past, that uh, we, I mean, printing the document was always at the top of our mind. Um, at least uh, we didn't want to make it difficult to do so. Uh, so we did some initial footwork, uh, some experiments, 
uh, you know, deciding on margin settings and thinking about um, spiral bound um, hole punchers and regular like three hole binder hole punchers, even um, internationally. We looked at the, the spacing of those things and tried to arrange the margin settings of these online documents so that um, they would most likely print with, uh, in a way that makes it practical for somebody to print it themselves and bind it themselves uh, should they do that. Um, whether we'll make a printed document or not, that's to be seen. Um, I think the feedback is so low. The need for it is so low. I don't think we will have to. Well, and I, certainly I wouldn't want to do so anytime soon because the information is changing all the time. So, um, you know, we're, we're, you know, still developing these documents. So we need to, you know, get to some point where the dust settles <laughs> before we decide, okay, we're going to go ahead and print. Well, you know what but, the solution is to having anything printed? This will get rid of all of your print needs. Just, just have some nice monitors in front of your face <laughs> and you can put up anything and everything you want at all times and you'll never, you'll, you'll never wish for paper. I mean, I, I find myself, my printer died and uh, I don't even want to replace it now because I, I never need it. I got everything I can, all the room I need to see anything. Hey, yeah. hey Jeff, I applaud that, but I want the form factor to be a little bit different. <laughs> I want the virtual field of my room and my glasses to be oh. showing me those documents off so I can leave them and just leave them there so I don't need the monitors in front of me wherever uh, I Ah, yes. Right. <laughs> I think the people asking for the paper documents, I don't think you're going to get any response from them here because I don't think they have computers. I think they, they're using teletypes to uh, type the code into the monitor. <laughs> <laughs> not quite like that, but I understand what you mean. <laughs> no, you know, it's, there's, there's plenty of It's very, of very simple. Where, just go to, to FedEx yeah. and get something printed. So this was 15 yeah. bucks. It took a day. So if anybody wants to print it, they can just download it and take it to, to FedEx and get them to do it for them. It's, yeah. it's very simple. Yeah, it's and, and still to this day, there's a lot of times where when I'm learning something brand new, I, I prefer to have it printed, um, you know, some little booklet. Um, but... If it's something that um, I know I'll be doing a lot of jumping around in, I prefer it to be online so that I can quickly search. I use Control F extensively throughout the day on various web pages and, and PDFs. Because and you have all those links forward and backwards where you can go to the instructions. So you can go back and forth. Yeah, I was thinking about that stuff and trying to make it. Um, as natural as I can in the confines of this Google Doc, ultimately what I would like to do is take uh, that information and make it um, uh, available on the web, something automatic so that uh, we don't have to do any special formatting, but it's just there so that you can quickly search and without having to download this huge PDF or this huge Google Doc uh, to find what you're looking for, something that's just shows up in Google search um, or uh, through just a key press in uh, the propeller tool or Eric's tool or whatever new tool somebody creates in the future that they can just you know link that link that pre-existing documentation in for the benefit of, of their users. An observation too, if I may, uh, somehow the spin two documentation is is being a little bit odd and maybe somebody will have a re uh, recipe that they can recommend. The issue for me is that I print it to a PDF and it becomes no longer searchable. Uh, maybe there's a way we can control that. It's not searchable because it's doing something like UTF-16 um, when it generates it. And so I don't know what caused that, but if anybody sees it and knows the workaround, please share it in the forums because I'd love to be able to. So you, you I need my uh, control, F, control F doesn't. Does not does not find anything in the document. Okay, I'll check with Stephanie about that because I know that there's certain things like links that are in the Google Doc that she has to recreate uh, because the PDF writer for some reason doesn't grab them. Uh, maybe she knows something about this problem. I haven't had that happen. No, it wouldn't be in the PDFs that you generate. It's when we take the print from PDF from the Google Doc itself is when I'm having the problem. So. 
I don't know if your PDF suffered the problem, but I certainly see it, and I'm doing this on Mac. So you're Chrome. you're you're in the live Google Doc, and you're doing pr uh, print to PDF. Print to PDF, and most of the time it's worked, but just recently it no longer works. So Is it? Um, so if you can, if if anybody has a recipe for making it, yeah, okay, mean searchability, let me know. One solution, of course, is to use Adobe Acrobat after the fact and OCR it. You know, optical character recognition. You could also just download the doc file. Um, you can go to file download and it will just let you download it as a docx. So. Yeah, maybe you should try that. Um, uh, if you exactly what Ada was saying, PDF file PDF. download and then there's PDF document. Uh, so there might be something that's being lost in the, you know, the print. Yeah, if, that's if you there. use a Word document, it's definitely searchable because that's that has to be searchable. Kind of um, with a PDF, it can be it can yeah. be not. It's doing some sort of character set translation, in, from what I'm seeing. Mm -hmm. Character set translation shouldn't affect searchability unless it's doing something very terrible and wrong. Um, well, I wish it didn't, but if you do a search, it's and you do a paste from the document, it's all. Squares, depending on what you're pacing into, you know the wow. unknown character kind. Oh, of that's the good old um, Mutibake, as we call yeah. it, or Zeichensalat in German. Um, it, that that is a character set character. problem. If you if you select it and copy it and paste it out, and it's gibberish, then yeah, that 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 is a stupid character uh, encoding issue. Exactly, and so that's why we have I'm... too many character encodings, and no one knows what to do with them. Agreed. So yeah, I'll, I'll try a different couple of things. And if I see a cause and a solution, I'll let everybody know. Jeff, can you repeat how many pages you estimate it will be all the combined documentation again with the P2 against the oh, P1? Oh, all the combined documentation? Oops. Yep. Um, I am really thinking it's gonna be like 700 pages. Uh, and, and that's really trying to keep things low. I mean, if I put the effort into it, like I did with the P1, uh, like I said, the, that manual um, that was just held up to the screen a little while ago was, uh, it's 399 pages. Um, and uh, this, I believe I'm at just short of 300 currently in what I've written myself, um, which includes material from, from chips, uh, documents, not all of it yet. So I've got to add that in. And then there's lots of examples I can think of, um, some more diagrams, which will take up space. I, yeah, I really think it's going to be above 700 pages of material altogether. And honestly, when I started thinking about that in the beginning, my first thought was, how is anybody ever going to learn everything? Um, but the point is, like, you don't need to learn everything. You just need to learn what you need to know right now uh, to get your task done. And that means we need extreme searchability, cross-linking, related topics, all that stuff thought about and kind of curated and, and put in there. Um, Along those lines, Jeff, I want to applaud your work because my my experience is that I'm having, I'm doing exactly what you're suggesting, and that is as I find new reasons to be creating instructions, as I'm writing new drivers for different pieces of equipment, I'm having very purposed reasons to go in and look at the document. And when you have these instructions grouped the way you do under those categories, that this is the type of manipulation you want to do here, are instructions that refer to it, that's excellent for finding these things. So uh, thank you for taking the time to do that. You're welcome. Thanks for looking the really good. Well. You know, I appreciate it. Jeff, we've talked in the past. If we could work this like they do video games where you start playing and you start using one initial skill, then you build skills. So eventually you're into the game and you, you know how to manipulate all of your whatever, all your resources. That would be great. If, if anyone can do that for a microcontroller, it would, it would make the uh, documentation searches minimal because they'd you know be learning as they went and then uh it would it would it would be self-perpetuating right yeah, yeah that's, so it's a game design thing right it's like like 
present a problem in a safe setting, then you um, and then you ramp up the difficulty on that yeah. same concept. Yeah. Hey, actually, kept... this is the kind of thing you could completely do. I just realized you're the you're the one that could do this. Oh, I can do a lot of things. Yeah. <laughs> actually, I don't do. But things. I mean, it would it would you'd have to you know there was a program uh, uh, like a assembly language program training thing where you were like the people's coder for the Soviet Union or something. And they would give you challenges to code up little programs in a set in 6502. And I guess they would simulate the, the, the code to see if you achieved the objective or not. But um, something kind of like that would be. Yeah, uh, you mean like a, like a sort of game about programming? Yeah, that's, yeah. you turn that's learning like... into a game with, with levels. <laughs> Yeah, I've, I've, yeah, I've seen a game like that, actually. Um, it was called um, uh, TIS 100, and it came with a manual that you're supposed to print out. But, um, and it looks and it's intentionally made to look like a cheap photocopy. It's great. Um, but that's about um, actually, pro um, that's also a programming game where basically you get a set of inputs and a set of outputs, and there's a sort of puzzle of how you do it with these really strange multi-core machines. Um, they have like only a few instructions and can exchange um, data with each other and it's really kind of interesting. You can find this yeah, that's, theme, right? Um, that sort of thing, but perhaps a bit more useful because um, using an actual machine that exists. Yeah, that could, you could do that. It, it, you know, building a simulator I could do might that. be part of the be part of the whole thing so that you could evaluate yeah. whether they wrote code that met any objective or not. Yeah, that, that, that would be really useful to have on, on the P2 itself, um, some sort of like memory protection. Uh, so you could just, in that case, you could just run the code, and um, it couldn't overwrite the like the like the hypervisor code that uh, makes it run. Yes. I guess you could put it into like the top 16k, but you could still kill it with like uh, cockstop and stuff. Yeah, it, it would require some planning about. It'd be like designing a video game. You know, they have a lot of people that don't really worry about programming, but like the storyline and how. Yeah, you have the story, the graphics, the music. And, yeah, music, right. Well, sometimes yeah. you just have one person doing everything. Like That's it's how it possible. Used to be. Yeah. You, you can still do it, but um, you end up with things that, of course, aren't like crazy 3D open world, uh, like, like going everywhere. Right. You have to pick your battles, basically. Yes, yes. That's, that's the problem. The TIS 100, this is found on Steam also, right? Yeah, yeah. That, that's, that's the one. OK, good. Just checking. Um, I'm looking at it right now. Hey, uh, Stephen, um, there's some discussion in the chat. I'm not sure if you're looking at that um, about a couple of different options for the PDFs. Is the, is the choice you're choosing when you go to print save as PDF, or does it say something else, print to PDF? Because I've noticed this, too, on mine, because I've had, I've had the Adobe uh, software installed various times, and I'll notice different choices. Uh, one is actually using the Adobe driver that I installed manually, and another is using, uh, I think, something that's built into Chrome in my case. And I think maybe I haven't seen the problem you're relating because I've just done it a different way, perhaps. Right. Um, and you're making me question how I did it. Um, there are a number of ways because I'm a Mac and I'm using Chrome on a Mac. Mm -hmm. Then I open the Google Docs. I can literally uh, from Google Docs save to PDF or I can print to system print and then use the system print to save to PDF or print right. to PDF or view as PDF. Too many choices. So the question is, I went down one of those paths and it gave me the 16-bit characters instead of eight. Now it's not searchable. So I'm going to have to recreate the path. And try okay. To I feel like I've followed at least two of those paths too. And it just, I, you know, didn't happen to find that problem. So it'd be interesting to find out what is the wrong path. Yeah. <laughs> and if there is a right path that works on all platforms. Uh, if I see a difference between the paths, I'll point it out because okay. this is driving me nuts and I forget. And if I don't point it out somewhere, I won't have a memory. So of it. Yeah. So. We'll figure it. Interrupt just for a minute, Jeff. Seems we yes. have concluded the uh, documentation side of things. So I'll stop the recording and let the Wild West resume. All right.